The Aquatic Ape Hypothesis, or Aquatic Ape Theory and also referred to as the Waterside Model, is the idea that the ancestors of modern humans, us, were more aquatic and were habitual waders, swimmers and divers. Could this explain some of our unique features? I'm your host Raphael and thanks for watching. This is the series where I tell you a story, its subsequent theories and explanations and then I let you make up your mind. If you like the weird, the wonderful, the creepy and the mysterious, you might want to subscribe to my channel and click the little bell to receive notifications. Also, if you enjoy this vid, you can like and share. Now let's study some anthropology. The Aquatic Ape Theory is an attempt at explaining why humans are so different from the other great apes. Hominids all diverge from common ancestors, but Homo sapiens more radically so. A number of people throughout history have noted that there must have been some evolutionary pressure on our line that wasn't on the others. Did the Homo genes go through an aquatic or at least amphibian stage? Or are the divergences the result of adaptations for moving from the trees to the savanna? Ah, oh, how refreshing! Even the scientists don't agree on stuff. There are several arguments in favor of the aquatic ape theory. First, we have no fur. The only other mammals that have no fur are aquatic, like dolphins and whales, or wallowers such as hippos and pigs and elephants. A lack of fur means we are efficient in swimming and have speed in the water. The standard model suggests that humans lost their fur to adapt to the heat of the savanna. However, other animals that spend a lot of time in the sun kept their fur for protection from that same heat. That sounds convincing. I actually didn't expect this. We have subcutaneous body fat. Unlike the other great apes, but like dolphins and whales, it provides buoyancy and insulation from cold water. Why would the standard model slather rolls of body fat onto creatures who needed to speed across the savanna for hunting and survival? Yeah, this doesn't give me any speed whatsoever. We are bipedal, standing upright on two legs. In water, this makes it possible to wade in greater depth. And for swimming, it allows a coordinated motion of arm strokes and leg kicks, as opposed to a clumsy dog paddle. How many other savanna animals have adopted this? Well, kangaroos come to mind. The fourth argument states that we can control our breathing consciously, unlike virtually all other animals whose breathing is autonomic. The only other mammals who do this are those who dive. They take a large breath to dive deep or a shallow one when swimming casually. Or control breathing to make a speech like I'm doing now. Lastly, we have sebaceous glands to make our skin oily, which is useless on the savanna but is quite good for waterproofing. It is the only known use of sebaceous glands in mammals. I'm not Oli, am I? Sounds compelling, doesn't it? However, the standard model wasn't pieced together by throwing darts, quick glances and first guesses. But by the totality of evidence from many fields of study, including anthropology, paleontology, primatology, human biology and paleoanthropology. So, what are the arguments against the aquatic ape theory? First, it is not true that a lack of fur is characteristic of aquatic mammals. The aquatic mammals that are furless, like the dolphins and manatees, are extremely specialized swimmers that have been radically adapted for swimming for tens of millions of years. Others, like hippos, adapted by becoming very massive. However, seals, otters, beavers, for example, remain furry. An aquatic ape 
would be unlikely to have lost its fur. Okay, what? Water doesn't make you lose fur? Or does it? I'm confused. Humans do have subcutaneous fat, but it is just like what the other great apes have. And it is not like the blubbery fat developed by the furless aquatic mammals. An aquatic ape's subcutaneous fat would not insulate nor provide buoyancy. Bummer, I was just about to jump in a pool to test it. Bipedalism has developed only in land animals and is not an adaptation for an aquatic life. All the mammals who use two legs like kangaroos, primates and bears are land animals. All of the aquatic mammals are either four-legged, like hippos, or use no legs at all, like dolphins. Well, told you about the kangaroos. It's also untrue that only humans and aquatic mammals can control their breath voluntarily. Most primates can hold their breath, and so can dogs. Humans do have much better breath control than any other animal. But we also use our breath for speech and other skills not found in the animal kingdom. I was right about the speech too. Humans do indeed have really big sebaceous glands that make our skin nice and oily. The only other mammal that does this is the lemur. And it is not aquatic. Why lemurs and humans have this is not understood. but. There is clearly no correlation between enlarged sebaceous glands and swimming. If it's not understood, then how can you make any conclusions about it? Skeptics also say that the reason the aquatic ape theory is why it has hung around for so long is its simplicity and with the seemingly elegant way that it is so thoroughly explains the differences between humans and other great apes. It is superficial, they say, appears to be logical and convincing. Don't you scientists always say the simplest explanations are often the right ones? Ockram's razor, you call it. In 2009, Richard Wrangham of Harvard University and colleagues suggested in the American Journal of Physical Anthropology that shallow aquatic habitats allowed hominids to thrive in savannas, enabling our ancestors to move from tropical forests to open grasslands. During certain seasons, already dry savannas became even more arid, making it difficult for hominids to find adequate food. But Wrangham's team argues that even in these inhospitable environments there were oases, wetlands and lake shores. In these aquatic habitats, water lilies, cattails, herbs and other plants would have edible, nutritious underground parts that would have been available year-round. These fallback foods would have gotten hominids through the lean times. The researchers base their arguments on modern primate behavior. For example, baboons in Botswana's Okavango Delta which floods every summer, start eating a lot of water lily roots when fruit becomes scarce. And hunter-gatherers in parts of Africa and Australia also eat a lot of roots and tubers from aquatic plants. The fossil records also hint at the importance of aquatic environment. They call it the new aquatic ape theory. Yes, we're there, we finally solved the mystery. Uh, not so fast though. Wrangham and his colleagues acknowledge that their case rests on circumstantial evidence and is no direct proof. All of the evidence has alternative explanations. For instance, water habitats allow for better fossil preservation and may not be representative of where they actually spend most of their time. So I guess the debate is still open. It is one of the most unusual evolutionary ideas ever proposed. Humans are amphibious apes who lost their fur, started to walk upright and developed big brains because they took to living the good life by the water's edge. But as always, there are alternative theories. 
The question always is, which one is true? You decide. There is a lot more to say about this topic than I did in this small vid, so if I forgot something or you have something to add, don't hesitate to do so. If you wish to do your own research, the links in the description might be a good start. Your thoughts and opinions are much appreciated, so drop a line in the box below. Just be respectful in the comments as there are real people with real feelings on the other side and I hope to see you next time. Bye!